Well, please stand for our call to worship, which is from Psalm 98. I always like this psalm because it talks about making a joyful noise to the Lord, and I can do that. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for He has done marvelous things. His right hand and His holy arm have worked salvation for Him. The Lord has made known His salvation. He has revealed His righteousness in the sight of the nations. He has remembered His steadfast love and faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. That, that includes us. Break forth into joyous song and sing praises. Sing praises to the Lord with the lyre, with the lyre and the sound of melody. With the trumpets and the sound of the horn, make a joyful noise before the King, the Lord. Let's do just that and make a joyful noise of the Lord as we sing Christ for the world we sing. Just a reminder, as we're making a joyful, joyful noise to the Lord as we sing, it's not just okay, it would be appropriate to smile as we sing. Let's go to the Lord and, uh, and pray. Father, we uh, thank you for the privilege of being able to sing praises uh, to uh, you in worship, because there is no one who deserves the, the glory and praise and honor uh, that you do. Specifically this morning, we praise your name for the gospel message, a message that's full of mercy and grace and hope and purpose and love and patience and forgiveness and peace and reconciliation, a message of good news that is based solely upon the life, death, and resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, a message that opens a door by faith for us to be adopted not just in any family, but into your family. A message that allows us to receive abundant blessings in this life and eternal blessings in the life uh, to come. A message that declares that we are new creations in Christ. The old has gone and the new has come. Father, forgive us when we place our identity in other people and things and situations. Our identity needs to be firmly rooted and the fact that we are yours. The gospel message that binds us together. Father, we are different. We have different backgrounds, different, a lot of differences. 
But our commonality cuts across all of that, our faith in your Son, Jesus. A gospel message that is wonderful, and we are called, we should be compelled to share it with others. Father, thank you for the privilege of being your messengers and your ambassadors. Help our hearts to break for the blind and the lost, for those who are far away from you. Family members, friends, co-workers, neighbors, even somebody that we might meet at lunch after worship. Help us to be bold. Help us to be consistent. Help us to be creative. Help us to be intentional. Help us to shine your gospel light into the darkness of this world. As your word says, help us to be all things to all people that we, through your Holy Spirit, might win some. All for your glory, so that more people would boast in your name. And now we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught his very first disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now using the Apostles' Creed, which will be on the screen to declare what we believe in common, the basic tenets of the Christian faith. Brothers and sisters in Christ, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He descended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated.
God's Word from Psalm 34. The young lions suffer want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Pray with me. Father, forgive us when we uh, seek satisfaction and other things that are not you. We're thankful that you do provide our needs and many of our wants, um, but Father, convince us that uh, you're, the, you're the real deal, and if we will seek you first, we will lack nothing. We thank you for what we do have. We thank you for the privilege of sharing it uh, with others. Uh, use these uh, ties and gifts above and beyond, Father, to, to help us do as a church what you've called us uh, to do. Father, that we would grow uh, the saints, we would grow the disciples, help them to grow in their faith and understanding your word and applying it and walking in it. Uh, but Father, we would also share with others who are far from you. You would receive all the glory and all the praise. And God's people said, Amen. Please be seated. Good morning, church. So good to be here with you uh, this morning on this Lord's Day. And uh, it is a uh, privilege always to bring God's Word uh, to you uh, here. And uh, while Pastor Ray and Clonell are away on uh, sabbatical, um, we uh, trust that they are having a, a very good time and uh, getting rest and renewal um, as they uh, d definitely need. And uh, I would uh, just continue to encourage you to uh, pray for Pastor Drew and elders and many other people that are picking up for Pastor Ray uh, while he is away, uh, big shoes to fill, and they need your prayers um, as they tend to uh, the various things and happenings here at First Presbyterian Church. Um, 
Drew also uh, mentioned that it might be a good idea just to update you all on uh, the youth ministry and seminary, and uh, I do appreciate your prayers as I continue in my studies at Erskine Theological Seminary, and uh, I'm getting, let's see here, December will be three years uh, of studies, and Lord willing, I will be uh, graduating uh, within the next two years, uh, so I appreciate your prayers. In fact, uh, Pastor Drew uh, is evaluating me here this morning, so all of you over there, make sure that he says nice things about me. Uh, in terms of the youth ministry, uh, God is doing a lot of great things in our young people's lives. We have an amazing group of core students who are hungry for God's Word, uh, who are gifted musically, um, and, and just it's a joy uh, to lead them. Uh, and we have uh, young people who are seeking, who are lost, and, uh, but they want to hear truth. And so we continue uh, to minister to them, and I appreciate uh, your support and uh, just the various ways uh, to our young people, um, because it's hard out there, and we have a lot of uh, students who come from uh, really broken families and tough situations, and so uh, we, we feel your prayers, and uh, we, we appreciate that, and the many other people that have joined alongside uh, our youth ministry. Uh, it is, uh, it's a great joy uh, to be part of that. Uh, as we go to God's Word uh, this morning, uh, we will be in Matthew uh, chapter 10. We'll be in verses 5 through 25, uh, continuing through uh, this uh, gospel. And uh, so here is God's Word. These 12 disciples, these 12 Jesus sent out, instructing them, go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans but rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel and proclaim as you go, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse lepers, cast out demons. You received without paying, give without pay. Acquire no gold or silver or copper for your belts, no bag for your journey or two tunics or sandals or a staff, for the laborer deserves his food. In whatever town or village you enter, find out who is worthy in it, and stay there until you depart. As you enter the house, greet it, and if the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it is not worthy, let your peace, your peace return to you. And if anyone will not receive you or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet when you leave that house or town. Truly I say to you, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah than for that town. Behold, I am sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. So be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Beware of men, for they will deliver you over to courts and flog you in their synagogues. And you will be dragged before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them and the Gentiles. When they deliver you, over, do not be anxious, for you are to speak, or what you are to say, for what you are to say will be given to you in that hour. For it is not for you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. Brother will deliver brother over to death, and the father to his child, and children will rise against parents and have them put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but the one who endures to the end will be saved." When they persecute you in one town, flee to the next. For truly I say to you, you will not have gone through all the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. A disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for the disciples to be like his teacher, and the servant like his master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebul, how much more will they malign those of his household? Amen. May the Lord bless the reading and proclamation of His Word this day. We all go on missions in life. Big ones, small ones. Some of us, most of us, venture to go on the mission of grocery shopping. 
We've all gone on that weekly mission to the grocery store or that last minute trip for something we forgot. But have you ever gone to the grocery store with your kids by yourself? That can feel like an impossible mission sometimes. Parents know that experience all too well. Finding a parking spot that isn't a mile away while also trying to be near a cart return. Keeping the peace with your children while also trying to keep your head as you grocery shop. Do I let the kids get a free cookie first or do I wait until the end as a reward? Depends on the day. When I run into someone I know, how much time do I have to have good conversation before the cart is rolling down the aisle because my kids decided it was time to have a WWE wrestling match in the middle of the grocery store? How will I handle the sticker shock of groceries at the checkout counter? And just when I think it's over, Florida rain comes pouring down on me as I try to load the kids and the groceries into the car. By the time I get home, I look like I came more from a water park than the grocery store. And parents here this morning know what I'm talking about. We all have to go on missions in life. Big ones, small ones, short ones, long ones. But what mission has God called you to do in this life? Short and long term. We are all called to proclaim the gospel. But what has God called you to do personally? Are you ready for a mission and calling greater than yourself? If God came calling today? That's what Jesus was calling the disciples to do. Something far greater and challenging than they could ever have imagined. This is the beginning of the mission discourse in, in Matthew's Gospel. And it is full of blessings and coming hardships. The disciples have been following Jesus as He preached about the kingdom life in His Sermon on the Mount. They have witnessed Him healing the sick and casting out demons. And the disciples' faith has already been tested in Matthew chapter 8 when Jesus calmed the storm. Now Jesus is sending the disciples out on their first mission to proclaim the gospel. Shorter accounts of Jesus sending out the disciples can be read in Mark chapter 6 and Luke chapter 9. However, Matthew's account is extensive, and clearly he wants the reader to understand the full context of the short mission to the Jews and the future mission to the world. The mission charge Matthew is giving here is the second of the five major discourses or complex sayings which constitute the framework of this gospel. Jesus sees the lost sheep and the need for a shepherd is great and he has compassion for them. He now extends that work to the disciples by sending them on this short mission trip to the Jews. The harvest is ripe and ready for a great gathering of lost sheep. The emphasis is on the opportunity not on the disaster in a hostile culture. We see here in Matthew a mixture of metaphors here to describe the mission at hand for the disciples. This opening charge to the disciples is unique to Matthew's Gospel. Stories of raising the dead and cleansing the lepers are very rare in the Gospel story, even as acts of Jesus. And nothing of this kind is reported of the disciples. As Pastor Ray has been leading us uh, through uh, this gospel, Matthew doesn't always give us the details of everything. Just that Jesus has given the disciples the authority and power to do such things as healing or raising the dead. In this uh, first half of our text this morning, Jesus begins by instructing the disciples to not only go to the lost sheep of Israel, but to only the lost sheep of Israel. The word used in the ESV is instruction. Uh, and the Greek word uh, for instruction is parangelios or parangelia. And means command, mandate, or order. 
This was not a mere suggestion by Jesus. This first mission will be restricted to God's people, set apart to be a blessing on the world. And this follows what God has established with Israel, and they are now called upon to make a decision about the gospel of the kingdom. And this underscores God's faithfulness to His covenant promise to Israel. Jesus' restriction from Gentiles and Samaritans is more than likely to dispel any doubt about the Messiah fulfilling the promises given to Israel. This is Israel's opportunity, and they will be fully responsible for their decision. In verses 7 through 8, the disciples are given the message and power for miracles. The kingdom of heaven is near. The raising of the dead comes back to Jesus, raising Jairus' daughter in chapter 9. In verses 8 through 10, Jesus tells the disciples what they will and will not need. They have been given power and authority to minister to the lost sheep of Israel. They are not to take any payment as they minister or any extra items that will take time to collect. Now, he's not saying, don't bring anything or go unprepared on the mission field. But rather that this mission is short and urgent, so guidelines are needed. The disciples are to rely on the hospitality of whom they minister to, something our American-minded culture has a hard time doing. In verses 10 through 15, Jesus gives the specifics of how they are to act in bringing the gospel message. They are to go into the homes of people who are receptive to the message, and they are to bring peace, not personal agendas. Charles Spurgeon, on the verse 12 of this passage, cuts to the core of the compassion and peace that Jesus wants his disciples to bring on the mission field. Say, peace be to this house, be very courteous, openly, and very benevolent, benevolent inwardly. You come as a benediction. Come with a benediction. We ought never to enter a house without wishing it good, nor to leave it without having endeavored to make it better. Do you have the mindset of blessing others in your Christian life? But, Jesus also says, if the gospel is outright rejected, the disciples are to move on. The act of shaking off the dust off one's feet was a sign used by the Jews when leaving Gentile regions so as to remove unclean elements. And this now turns on the Jews who reject the gospel as a form of judgment. I tell you the truth, it will be more bearable for Sodom and Gomorrah on that day of judgment than for that town. This is a warning to Israel. Your religious privilege will not get you into heaven. You are responsible for the rejection of the promised Messiah. Blessings and punishments await Israel. And that takes us to our first point here that I want to make this morning in our passage. And that is we need instructions and training on how to live and proclaim the gospel in a hostile world. We are to train up one another for preparing for small And big gospel missions. Every disciple of Jesus is a missionary. Carrying out the message of salvation to our community and the world is a vital part of our discipleship. That is why we as a church support so many missionaries and missions. Short missions and long-term missions. Church planning. As Pastor Drew mentioned last week in his sermon the many people that we have supported in church planning as a church and missions. It's so vital in the life of a church and our calling to bring the good news of the gospel to the world. Our youth, every couple of years, they go on a mission trip, a short-term mission trip, a week-long mission trip uh, over spring break. Lord willing, we will go back in 2024 spring break to a place that uh, God knows and we don't know yet, Um, but He knows. That's a vital time for our young people. 
not only to the people and the churches that we go to serve, but for them to be out on the mission field, outside of Lake Placid. Lake Placid is a mission field, but so are the other places that they go and serve, and they get to go out of their comfort zone and work and share the gospel. Sometimes that even leads to further missions. Sometimes that leads to a calling on a young person's life. We have also supported uh, such young people as Sarah Gillis with YWAM and Claire Fipers with her uh, Southeastern uh, University with their missions. Uh, Claire Fipers, her first mission trip was with this church in 2019 to Costa Rica. And that gave her, <laughs> she came back from that trip and had a great passion for reaching the lost people around the world and for missions work. And since that first missions trip, 2019, I think she's been on like eight missions trips around the world. God is doing a great work. And we as a church, when we support missions and church planning, we, we see the fruit of it. And it is a blessing it is encouragement to us, and we play a vital part in that, in our support and our prayers for them. Christian education and ministries of this church help prepare followers of Jesus for daily gospel life. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, all Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be equipped for every good work. Our children's ministry, our youth ministry, our adult ministries. I, we could go on and on with a, a list. A couple pages of ministries in this church. They are all so important to our training in the mission field. We should come to church functions expecting God to do something in and through us for daily mission work. <laughs> Woe is me! When I come to church, Christ's church, half-heartedly, like it's just another trip to the store or another errand to run, we need to evaluate our hearts as we come to the Lord's church and the services and ministries that we are a part of. There's not a moment to lose as Jesus is impressing upon the disciples in this urgent, short mission to the Jews. Point number two here this morning is when we share the gospel with someone, we are to bring peace as much as possible. In other words, don't go into conversations with a political or theological agenda that will turn people off to hearing the good news of the gospel. Do people see us for more of what we are against? Or for more of what we are for. Don't get me wrong. There are places and times to have those hard conversations. Important conversations. But don't let that be on the forefront of gospel life. We are to be about the Lord's business. First and foremost. Not our own. That oftentimes means evaluating our own heart. Before we go into having conversations with people about the gospel. In the second half of this mission's discourse, Jesus now turns his attention to instructing the disciples to the future, the future long-term mission to the world. This time will be different. They will be like sheep among wolves. This mission will include the Gentiles and will fulfill the Great Commission, as we see at the end of Matthew's Gospel. Jesus is laying down the groundwork for missions to the nations until the very end of the age. In verse 16, Jesus warns the disciples that a certain tact will be required as persecution will come. The serpent was a symbol of wisdom and shrewdness, while the dove represents innocence. There is a balance that is needed carrying out the gospel mission in a hostile world. The disciples are to be smart and genuine in navigating a gospel-centered life. 
The disciples are also to be on guard against men who desire them harm. In verse 17, they are not to go looking for trouble, but must be vigilant about their surroundings. Jesus says that they will be a witness to the Gentiles in verses 18 through 20, and they will face trials and persecution. That is unavoidable as Christ's followers. However, they will be given great opportunities before kings and governors to proclaim the good news of Jesus. So do not be anxious about what you will say, for the Holy Spirit will speak through you as Christ's witness. When I think about this passage, uh, it reminded me of uh, my first opportunity to go uh, on a short-term missions trip. Uh, I was uh, in high school, in my early days of high school, I got the first opportunity to go to inner city Atlanta to do missions work. And that was probably around the time Pastor Drew was here. I'm not sure exactly when, but uh, close to. Maybe Pastor Drew had been here already. But uh, when we went on this trip, of course, like any missions trip, you prepare. You get ready for the work that you're going to do, for sharing the gospel, for vacation Bible school. And on this trip, we got to do a variety of things in this, uh, this church and mission that was in uh, downtown Atlanta. And one of the things that we had the opportunity to do was we took a, an afternoon to go share the gospel door to door. And of course, we prepared and we had our gospel tracks. We had practiced and we were going out. We were getting our feet wet and going and just sharing the gospel door-to-door knocking. And as we were going about, uh, me and uh, one of my friends growing up, and uh, then youth director Karen Hine uh, were with us because we we all dispersed in groups of three to four. And so there was three of us, and as we were going, we went to places where we were not welcome. And so we moved on. And then we came to uh, one house, And as we came, you could hear very loudly that uh, things were not good inside of that home. There was yelling, there was crashing, there was foul language that was being spoken. To be honest, uh, (laughs) me and my childhood friend, we we were a little nervous. And as we got to the door, we we looked at our youth director and We really weren't sure if we should even knock at the door. And then we all agreed. We said, we're going to knock on this door. But we're having a plan. If things go south, we're going to run as fast as we can and get out of there. (laughs) But we're going to proceed and we're going to do it. And so you hear all this noise and we knock on the door. And we had to knock pretty loudly so they could actually hear that there was a knock on the door. And the commotion stopped. And this big, burly man opens the door. And I was nervous. But we were trusting in the Lord. And (laughs) our youth director, Karen, she she let us lead the way and, and... Share the gospel with our gospel tracks. And we were fumbling around, not only because we were scared, but because we were just, we were nervous. In fact, if you were to give us a grade on how we were sharing those gospel tracks, I'm pretty sure we would have got an F because we were just fumbling around with our gospel tracks. Yet, God did something amazing. There was a peace that took place as we shared. This man, this big man, our Goliath, suddenly was calm. The Holy Spirit opened his eyes, opened his heart, opened his ears. And before we knew it, this man was saved. He believed, he received the good news of the gospel. Salvation had come to that house. 
That's my God. That whole day, (laughs) the most unlikely of places that we were going to find someone who would receive the good news, that man was the only one that day that received the gospel. Never underestimate the work of the Holy Spirit. The third point we we have this morning is that the Lord helps us persevere as we obediently follow the mission of the gospel. Jesus does not sugarcoat the realities of gospel life in this world. Not only will opposition come from the Jews and the Gentiles, but also from family because of the disciples' commitment to Christ alone. The privilege of carrying His name will bring hatred and suffering. However, Jesus gives great assurance that in spite of this, the hatred of mankind will not overcome the disciples. They will endure to the end when they will experience the blessing and peace of eternity with Christ our Lord. Until then... Jesus will be with them every step of the way. The meaning of verse 23 is one of the most challenging in the Bible among scholars and theologians. What does go through all the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes mean in this context? Some have suggested that it means until Jesus' resurrection, the fall of Jerusalem in AD 70, or when Christ returns again at the end of the age. The latter seems to fit the context here, but the main point is that the mission to Israel will continue alongside the mission to the Gentiles. Verses 24 and 25 serve as a guide for the central importance that the disciples are to be like their master and teacher in doing His kingdom work. Nothing more, nothing less. The Pharisees had accused Jesus of casting out demons by Satan in Matthew 9.34. The absurd accusation that Jesus had an alliance with Satan will naturally be thrown against the disciples as well. The mission-minded disciples must be ready for what is to come in gospel mission life. Diedrich Bonhoeffer, the German pastor and theologian who opposed the Nazi regime, understood the cost of faithfully following Jesus in his day and time. He would be executed before the end of the war for his opposition to the Nazis. In his well-known book, The Cost of Discipleship, he speaks to this very text in Matthew's Gospel when he says, The messengers of Jesus will be hated to the end of time. They will be blamed for all the divisions which rend cities and homes. Jesus and His disciples will be condemned on all sides for undermining family life and for leading the nation astray. They will be called crazy fanatics and disturbers of the peace. The disciples will be sorely tempted to desert their Lord. But the end is also near, and they must hold on and persevere until it comes. Only He will be blessed who remains loyal to Jesus and His Word until the end. Diedrich Bonhoeffer remained loyal to the very end. He was reported to be praying on his hands and knees to the Lord on the day of his execution. The Apostle Peter understood the cost and blessing of living the gospel life. 1 Peter 4, 12-14 Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice in so far as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when His glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the Spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. Hardship and suffering for Christ is not to be avoided. When we suffer for His sake, our union with Him is stronger and sweeter than anything this world can offer. For we have Jesus Christ, our Savior, who suffered and died and rose again so that we would no longer be lost sheep without a shepherd. 
And when we feel the weight of living the gospel life in this hostile world, may we be reminded of the great care that our shepherd has for us from Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for His name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Beloved, you are the light of the world. So let your light shine before others so that the lost sheep may see and believe in the Good Shepherd, Christ our Lord and Savior. For the glory of His kingdom. Amen. Heavenly Father, You are a mighty God, beautiful Savior, wonderful friend, who has rescued us, your people, who were once lost but now are found. And Lord, you have given us and commanded us to go forth and proclaim the good news to find the lost sheep. Lord, we thank You for all that You have given us. We thank You, Lord, for all that You have called us into. Lord, we pray as Your people that we would obediently listen to Your calling on our lives as Your church and in our own personal lives. Lord, may we be reminded this day that You are with us to the very end of the age. Give us the boldness. Give us the confidence to carry out the mission. May we not be afraid. May we not grow weary. For you fill our cups, Lord. You guide us through the darkest of times. You have gone before us, our God and our King. Lord, help us this day to follow you all with our hearts, our souls, and our minds. We thank you, Lord, for your mercy and your grace that is new every day. Guide your people as a good shepherd. In Jesus' name, amen.
I sang that song, I did two things. One, I praise the Lord for those that God is calling, for the Thames and the Scots and the Marks and the Clares and the Sarahs and the Reeds. Is he a keeper or what? <laughs> praise the Lord. Pray for Reed. He's got a lot on his plate, being a dad and a husband and Youth minister, sports ministry, seminary, other things. Plays basketball with me. That's tough, right? Tough. Pray for, pray for me. He's got sharp elbows. Um, but also as we sing that song, it, causes, it should cause us to pray. Who's next? Who next is God raising up? I praise the Lord for Marty and Becky. But who, who, who is next that God is raising from this church to go? And maybe it's you. Are you praying for you that God would lead you? Our blessing from uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is this. By God's grace and the power of the Holy Spirit and by relying upon the power of Jesus' resurrection, may you be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain, this day and forevermore. Go in peace.